So yeah. So um, let's get going. I will start by sharing my screen because oh, maybe I'll do it like this. Yeah, so welcome to the February edition of AI Paper Spotlights, our machine learning research meetup here in Berlin. I would say also um, one of the most researchy and maybe nerdy events we have here at the AI campus. Um, it's organized by Marantix Momentum's research team. Marantix Momentum is part of Marantix. Um, and we do research and we also uh, develop machine learning um, and machine learning projects for clients. And today we actually have all of our research team currently uh, presenting our NeurIPS highlights. So in December, we all went to NeurIPS to present, I think, was it five even papers, uh, posters? Four. Okay, four. Still quite a lot. Um, and uh, we've presented some of the results in the earlier editions of AI Paper Spotlights. But today, uh, we will share some of the cool insights that we took home with us. So um, just um, posters and presentations and papers that we found um, that really sparked our interest and that we wanted to share with you guys. So um, today we have four speakers, uh, including myself, who will be speaker and moderator. Uh, I will try to wear these two hats. Um, <clears throat> so um, our first speaker today will be Felix Pipa. Felix, will you come up on stage? So I can present you while you're up here. So Felix is a machine learning researcher at Morantis Momentum since a year. And you're interested in optimization, um, yeah, neural networks, parallel, parallel compu computing, all kinds of stuff, right? Graphs, trees, all the good stuff. Um, and Felix, you can take it away. Oh, also. Before we start, I should say that after each presentation, we'll try to keep the presentations to about 10 minutes. And then we have five minutes for Q&A directly after per person. And we will moderate, I will take questions from the room, but also from the chat. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, this works. Uh, one moment. Okay. Yes, uh, today I wanted to talk about the paper I saw there that was the feedback feed forward algorithm. It is a bit of a weird name, but it uh, makes maybe sense uh, soon. Uh, the paper uh, was from Tosi and Issa. Um, they're both from Columbia University. And they mainly focus their research on bioplausibility. Um, okay. okay, so bioplausibility, the main idea is that we look at our brain and like look at how we process information and train it we compare this and evaluate uh, machine learning models uh, and methods. And um, the idea with that is that we then find new algorithms that work better than current algorithms. So because like when we compare like, for example, ChatGPT, it's like a lot of training data to learn what like a child learns uh, in much less examples. Um, so the problems they look at is uh, the weight transportation problem. That is the idea that in that congregation, you need the weights from the forward pass to um, calculate the gradient. Um, and in our brain, we don't do that. Like the weights are not shared between the forward pass and the back pass. And uh, yeah, also one thing they look at is that the brain has feedback connections. That means that there are, in your brain, there are neurons that go from the eye, from the signal to inside your brain, and also then to process the signal. And there are also some neurons who go the other way around. So they go from the brain outside to the eye. And um, they do some predictive coding. So they uh, predict the future. And uh, yeah, they also like change the activations of the neurons. Um, so when we look at the weight transportation problem, uh, as I already said, what happens is that we need, in back propagation, we need the gradient and the weight from the forward pass to calculate the gradient from the backward pass. And this is not really happening in the brain. And the idea that came out 2014 already 
from Lillicrap at all um, is, okay, we don't have this in the brain. Why are we doing this in neural networks? And they say, okay, what happens if we just throw this away? We don't calculate the gradient through uh, the weights from the forward pass, and we just use some random matrices. Um, this sounds a bit weird. Like, why would it work at all? Um, but they evaluated and tested this, and the network actually can train stuff. And um, most of their paper is um, to evaluate or like to explain why this actually works. And uh, yeah, they go in a lot of depth, but the main gist, what they say is what is their uh, hypothesis, why this worked because they didn't prove anything, is that uh, the weights from the forward pass adjust to the random weights in the backward pass uh, because they are fixed in the whole training and they don't change at all. And uh, the paper I wanted to talk about took this idea and wondered, okay, why do we actually need to uh, use random weights? Uh, That's also not how the brain works. The brain doesn't have fixed weights from the beginning of birth, but it trains the whole life. Um, so what they said, okay, what if we just learn these gradient weights or backward weights uh, again? So what they do is they, um, yeah, they have these forward weights. for normal inference, and then they have the backwards weights to estimate the gradient uh, in the backward pass. And um, yeah, to uh, show us an example of how they calculate the gradients, I uh, wanted to point out this simple network. So we have two, uh, we have three layers. Uh, we have one input layer, one output layer, and one hidden layer. And um, to calculate the output and the losses is mostly the same. So we have a big but to calculate the gradient, we don't use, uh, like this is the same formula as normal backpropagation, but we don't use uh, the forward pass weights, but to calculate the weights, the gradient for the forward pass, we use the backward pass weights. And uh, yeah, to train the backward pass weights with the same thing, with the forward pass weights. And with that, we can then loop over training and train our models. And it's uh, an interesting alternative to the normal backpropagation algorithms. Um, so they tested this again and did some experiments with it. And they um, got some really interesting results on MNIST. And um, you can see that the uh, discrimination, so the classification in, in general, um, is competitive with normal backpropagation. The black line is backpropagation, the green line and is the algorithm, the, uh, the red line is the algorithm they introduced, and the green line is the previous algorithm. And yeah, you can see that they have competitive results in classification and they have much better results in reconstruction. Because what you can do is when you have this loop, you can just iterate over and over over it. And then you kind of reconstruct the image because you have a reconstruction loss in the bottom. And what they show is, oh, you can't really see that here, but um, what they show is that uh, other models are really good in discrimination or really good in reconstruction, but not in both and their approach can be good in both. Um, yeah, here's some examples for the reconstruction. Um, as you can see, like they just put the input in a lot of noise and then they get really good uh, reconstruction images out of it. And the other, all, all the approaches really suffer from that. And here's a cool example where they just took the uh, normal MNIST image and then occluded it with looks like a lot of noise and it could then reconstruct this image and it even found out during this reconstruction that here's something in the middle that's not normal, that there's like something missing or there's something weird in the image. Um, yes. And what they also found out is that this root is really, really robust to noise. And um, yeah, when you put much noise on the input images, it's really good to yeah evaluate. Um, yeah, what is the conclusion from all of this paper? Um, I think the biopossibility is a really interesting, really interesting approach because it really gives uh, new perspectives on the machine learning approaches we have. Um, this, for example, is really robust to noise. Um, it has good in reconstruction. But the main problem with the biopossibility approaches that we have currently is that they don't have scale. So, for example, if you have the picture on the right that is with uh, generative stable diffusion, and it just works currently much, much better 
then the own trains much much better than the other approaches uh, they introduce. But I think uh, they, they give a good alternative that maybe needs some tricks here and there to get better results and competitive with that corrugation. Um, yeah, that's basically the same point. Um, yes, I think I'm in time. I hope. So if there's any questions. Hi. Um, do they mention anything about, uh, for example, the negative uh, aspects of neural networks like uh, exploding gradients? Like, uh, are they somehow uh, dealt with if you train the backwards? Uh, um, they talk about uh, recurrent neural networks, yes. Um, but they don't claim that this helps with exploding gradients or something. Um, they didn't investigate that deeply, but maybe that helps. Yeah. I don't know. Thank you. Anyone else? Do they do any um, performance evaluation in terms of influence speed? I mean, you don't do any backdrop, so I suppose training is a lot faster. Um, you like they basically do backpropagation, but they don't calculate the gradient the same way. Yes. Um, so on inference, it should be the same because the forward pass yeah, is the same. during training. Um, uh, they didn't do that, but I would think it should be the same because they also have to go backwards. So what they did, I looked into the, they published their code on GitHub. And what they actually did is there was the first in this field with the forward alignment that they use PyTorch, the PyTorch hooks to adjust the backpropagation that they don't use the forward weights, but like use the backward backward weights to calculate the gradient. And um, so they just use the normal PyTorch backpropagation. So I think it's mostly the same, Doesn't, no improvements, I guess. But a forward alignment algorithm that just used random weights, that should be faster. Thank you. Does the forward weights and the backward weights converge to each other? Uh, no, I don't think so. But um, what the paper of um, forward alignment found out, so the first paper was a random, pap uh, random paper, and with the random weights and random paper, uh, what they found out was that uh, basically the angle of this uh, approximated random gradient and the real gradient kind of point in the same direction. And that's like one of the reasonings why um, this actually works because at some point uh, during in the beginning of training the, the the gradient of the fake gradient just points anywhere but since the forward pass aligns with the random gradients they at some point point in the same direction the final point of the angle or something yeah all right okay. thank you very much felix So moving on to the next talk, uh, I will talk about concept binding in text to image models. And, oh, okay. So I'm going to start with a practical example. Um, we built in the last couple of months, we built a demo based on stable diffusion XL um, and where we basically wanted to generate full images. And one of my colleagues had the idea to generate the following. A futuristic technology leader with burgers as hands and so on. And as you can see in this image, uh, he doesn't have burgers as hands. Uh, he has a burger uh, and the hand is beside the burger. And additionally, there are some burger related artifacts that have appeared in the image, such as a plate and some kind of burger sauce. So it seems that the conceptual binding in the prompt doesn't carry over to a uh, correct conceptual binding in the image. So you might think that this is, seems to be a very niche problem of generating people with burgers as hands. Why should we care about it? It's really esoteric, but actually some other people have also encountered this problem and have been trying to address it. So um, 
One was this poster that I found at New Rips, which is basically uh, looking into the matter and also suggesting a theory to, um, to change this at inference time. And then, of course, I went down a bit of a spiral um, and was thinking about why is this the case? Why is this a problem in the first case? And that's the second uh, paper that I will also um, discuss briefly. So let's start with uh, the linguistic binding and diffusion models. Um, so here, they basically came up with a bunch of examples where you can see that um, the prompt uh, is not well represented in the image. So we can have a semantic leak in the prompt, so an attribute leaking over to a different object. Um, we can also have semantic leak out of the prompt. Um, so here, the checkered bowl leaks out to basically checkered patterns everywhere. Um, or we can have attribute neglect. So here, basically, we just see a lion and a monkey. No horns or spots. Um, so they propose here um, actually a method that can align uh, these uh, attributes with the appropriate concepts uh, without actually even fine tuning the, the model. And in order to understand how they actually do this, uh, we might need a very short recap on what stable diffusion actually does. Um, so here uh, on the right side, we have a text prompt that goes in to um, our model via a text encoder. Uh, in this case, a model called Clip that's um, um, trained to basically align images and captions uh, in a shared space. And then we have this denoising unit that starts at a random noise input. So that's set T here. And then iteratively denoises this by passing it through a unit multiple times and basically arriving at Z as uh, at zero, which is a, an image of the kind that you've seen before. And while um, this denoising happens, basically um, it's a process that's attending to the text representation via these QKV uh, matrices here inside the unit. Um, and uh, the intuition that uh, these authors base their approach on is basically that um, attributes and nouns that belongs together should also attend to the same pixels in space. So here we have a red crown and a golden strawberry and the red crown, red and crown should bo both point to the same um, pixels basically uh, because red is an attribute of crown um, and golden strawberry should also point towards the same pixels. So what they basically do is that they uh, create this um, can I, yeah, this syntactic tree um, using basically a, a, a syntactic parser. And then you can extract these uh, modifier and noun pairs. And now we basically say that um, these um, attributes, attribute golden pointing to strawberry. These two should also point to a similar um, pixel representation. And the, those attributes that point to different uh, nouns, or basically this attribute doesn't point to this noun crown, and therefore they should be pushed apart. Um, and so basically they, they um, create this basic contrastive loss function over the attention maps. And instead of actually fine tuning uh, the whole attention weights using this loss function, which could have also been an interesting approach, they basically just calculate it at inference time and they take a single gradient step to, to align the attention maps basically. And they do that for the first 50% uh, of the denoising steps. And basically they have quite nice results in their paper. Uh, I won't go through all of them now, but I encourage you to have a look uh, also because you can see a lot of pictures with birds with crowns and other funny, <laughs> um, funny um, scenarios that they've come up with. Uh, but instead of going deeper into that, I wanna go into the why a bit. So why is this a problem in the first case? 
So basically, um, in this paper, they benchmark a lot of these different uh, language vision models. And uh, they now try to basically see how aware are they of sentence comp composition. So here, for instance, we see blip. Uh, and that for this image of the horse eating the grass, it actually prefers the caption, the grass is eating the horse. Um, and they, they've basically created a whole benchmark to test it on different, um, different attributes. And as you can see, like many of these models perform close to chance level uh, in accuracy on these tasks. Um, and going a bit deeper into like, how can these models still behave so well on the normal evaluation task. So normally models, uh, vision language models are evaluated on retrieval. So given a prompt in the test set, which image, uh, so given a caption, which image is it most likely to, uh, to belong to that caption? And basically here they try, they test it on retrieval, but with scrambled sentences. And as you can see, so the blue here is unscrambled and then they do a bunch of different shuffling. Um, and basically uh, the performance is almost unaffected by completely shuffling the captions. Uh, so it seems like they're behaving more like a bag of words than actually uh, understanding the composition of the sentences. And almost similarly with uh, scrambling uh, image patches, so here it seems that um, the performance does degrade a bit more. And why is that the case? So uh, pre-training track task for CLIP is actually to align text and image pairs by contrastive learning. Um, and that's basically a retrieval task. So, um, so basically this is what they're trained to do. But how can we make them also understand these more subtle um, differences between captions uh, that are in the composition? So here they propose actually to use, um, to add um, negative captions. So hard negatives uh, in this uh, contrastive uh, training approach. So basically um, not only taking a black cat sitting on a desk and contrasting it to something completely different, but also contrasting it to a black desk sitting on a cat. Uh, and basically um, it has to also learn these like relations between the objects. Um, and as you can see in their evaluation, uh, they fine tuned clip uh, using this task um, and they can do quite a lot better on these new benchmarks that they've come up with um, without sacrificing the normal retrieval performance. So basically the main takeaways of uh, these, this little deep dive uh, is that uh, text to image generation is limited by lacking compositional awareness. Um, you can fix it at inference time as the authors of the first paper did by basically trying to align the attention maps based on the prompt composition. Um, but the core problem persists and that's uh, that seems to be that seems to be following from this retrieval focused uh, training and evaluation uh, in CLIP basically, or, or uh, similar models. Um, so one approach to solve the problem a bit better would be to basically fine tune with the, these compositional hard negatives. Um, and then for the future, the question is like for the next generation of visual language models, maybe we actually need some new training objectives. Yeah, so that was me. That was all for me. Questions? How good is the inference time fix approximately? Like, can we get a man with burger hands? <laughs> I, I wonder, I haven't tried it myself. I um so they they do some quite difficult things but it doesn't work every time and also the more they enforce this like attention map alignment the more uh, the image quality degrades 
So I feel like it's kind of an intermediate fix. Got it. Thank you. I have to check online. Any more questions? No? No. Okay. Let's head to the next next one. So next up is Max. So Max is a machine learning research team lead here with us. You are the one who's been with us longest, I think, in our team yeah. currently. Uh, and you have a PhD in physics, but you kind of steered more and more towards uh, towards uh, computer vision, right? Exactly. Yes. And what are you going to talk about today? I will present some highlights around tabular deep learning at NeurIPS. Um, so, yeah. yes. Um, I'll take a bit of a different approach and um, not dive into one specific uh, paper that I found, but rather look at what happened in the context of uh, tabular deep learning at NURBS. Mm -hmm. um, since that's something that we currently find interesting, not only for our own projects, but also as skills and tabular um, applications in manufacturing, but also healthcare. So that's something that we've started looking at more closely in our research team as well. And the tabular domain is still something that is mostly considered to be dominated by statistical kind of classical uh, methods such as gradient boosted trees and so forth. So it's interesting to kind of observe how the community is kind of halfway still in that paradigm and arguing for gradient boosted trees are the go-to solutions to everything. And other people, uh, for example, people like Frankota and, and Freiburg, um, going more and more into the deep learning direction uh, for tabular deep learning. So I went across NeurIPS having a kind of a special focus on that and will highlight kind of two full track papers that I found interesting and two workshop papers from the table representation learning workshop, um, which had its... Um, I think it's okay. Yeah. Um, the table representation learning workshop, which had its second edition now at NeurIPS, so it's also kind of highlighting its search and interest uh, in the of the community and tabular deep learning actually um, but with that being said i'm not going to go into too much technical details as the previous talks but rather give a little bit of uh, outlines of the papers that i found interesting so actually for full track papers surprisingly little going on to be honest um, there were a handful of papers that were somewhat interesting um, some around benchmarks for example but the one that kind of mostly struck my eye or my interest um, was called High Dimensional Tabular Deep Learning with an Auxiliary Knowledge Graph uh, by people uh, around Ruse and others uh, from Stanford. Um, the basic idea is rather straightforward conceptually. So they looked at uh, supervised uh, classification and regression problems on tabular data. So very standard paradigm looking at a single table and a single task per table. And they say, well, conventional approaches face problems uh, when you have very wide tables, so a lot of columns, but very few samples, so very few rows. And neural networks also have problems, or like conventional neural networks uh, deep learning approaches also have problems because you have very few samples, but highly parameterized models, so you kind of tend to overfit. And what they do is, well, okay, they cannot use data from other tables explicitly. That's something we will look at in the in the last highlight also. But they can implicitly use data, uh, knowledge data uh, available maybe from other domains um, via a knowledge graph. So what they do is use this auxiliary information using a big knowledge graph that they obtained prior to training, actually. So they don't go that into de too much detail here but use this knowledge graph to kind of align features by their similarity also in the knowledge graph. So basically on a technical level, they say, well, if we have two input features in this table um, that are similar in the knowledge graph, have similar node embeddings and are kind of related in the knowledge graph, they should have a similar weight uh, in the weight matrix. So the corresponding weight vectors of the first layer of the neural network that they're investigating. So on the um, on the kind of topology side, they just investigate a similar, very simple neural network, uh, uh, I think one hidden layer MLP, and the layers from the, the weights from the first layer, they kind of in get from the knowledge graph, so to speak, very roughly speaking. So 
uh, a little bit, only technical detail I'm going to show probably is kind of the architecture overview. Uh, it's not so important, all the details, but it kind of shows all the, all the things that are involved. They kind of have this big knowledge graph that they um, obtained prior from other, actually from other data, from other um, studies beforehand. They then do a self-supervised kind of find or pre-training on that knowledge graph to, to uh, fine tune the node uh, embeddings of the features that are available in the current table that they're investigating. Then they have the message passing algorithm. So something from GNNs to kind of fine tune on the specific context of the table. So that's going shown in C. And then they use this with another kind of beta network B to infer the weights of the first layer of the MLP. So it's kind of, I mean, that's kind of details on the implementations, I would say, of the idea. But roughly speaking, the idea is, okay, I can use the contextualized information from my knowledge graph where I have embeddings of the features, which know more of the domain. For example, they focus on pharma here and on healthcare the domain. So they have all kinds of medical information in the knowledge graph. And they use the node embeddings to kind of given inductive bias for the first uh, uh, weight matrix of the MLP, basically. So that's kind of conceptually what's going on here, which I found quite interesting. They do a not super elaborative evaluation, but a fair elaboration. They compare with uh, th 13 baselines, and they look at 10 tabular data sets, important to say, all from the same domain, because the knowledge graph is very domain specific. They look at healthcare data here in particular, and that knowledge graph is kind of obtained from prior works. Uh, and which is huge. It has over 100,000 nodes and uh, 3 million edges. So it's not obtained from this one table that they're looking at, but it's kind of pre-calculated. And yeah, they of course show that it's SOTA when the case that they were looking at is actually the case. So when you're very wide, but very uh, not so tall tables and it's competitive in, in the rig in normal, normal cases. And they also look at some ablations, some of which I pointed out here. So that actually using the knowledge graph um, kind of contributes positively to the performance. That being said, that was kind of the, the most conceptually interesting paper, I think, in the domain of tabular learning for the more kind of standard approaches. Um, on the full track side, um, this paper, which also kind of went through the Twitter bubble uh, some months prior to Europe's, was also quite interesting. Uh, when do neural nets outperform boosted trees on tabular data? So one of these questions that always comes up, people arguing for or against uh, deep learning methods and investigating conventional methods like gradient boosted trees in that uh, case um, and looking at when do they actually perform better then people come around and say, ah, if this transformer now, this works better then people come and say, no, this actually doesn't work better if you probably fine tune your cat boost. Um, so they go about this quite um, thoroughly, uh, which is really nice. So the experimental setup is very good. Um, so this is actually not technically a full track paper it's from the full track of a, but the benchmark data set kind of track of NeurIPS. Uh, i mean little um side effect um, but they you look at 19 algorithms uh, um, a lot of the well-known candidates that you probably know uh, if you have a statistics background or whatever machine learning background like cat boost xg boost um, standard models like linear models, uh, logistic regressions, all the stuff, then some more tabular specific things, but also standard deep learning based like, like sim sim simple MLPs and things like that. They look at 176 data sets and they perform a tenfold cross validation and hyperparameter tuning for all investigated methods. So that's really nice. It's a very thorough uh, evaluation and people can start reusing their findings and their uh, numerical kind of benchmark results and not reuse or redo every time um, their own results. So it's a nice benchmark, of course. They say they find little differences between gradient boosted trees and neural networks. And that hyperparameter tuning on a gradient boosted tree, I think in particular cut boost is usually the, the best performing one, is more important than choosing between deep learning approaches and um, yeah, classical approaches. I'm reflecting the author's uh, wording here. I'm I'm not convinced uh, entirely by, by the, the generality, uh, generality of these uh, statements as something um, we will highlight also later a little bit, but that's what they find. They also look at TAP PFN, maybe you've heard, I think that was at NERPS last year. So from uh, Frank Hutter's uh, team in Freiburg, it's a kind of Bayesian inference, approximate Bayesian inference framework for um, doing kind of classification on tabular data in a single forward pass is a, is a really nice paper. If you don't know it and are interested in this, uh, check it out. They find actually, again, the TAP PFN outperforms most of the algorithms uh, in 
in most cases, but in that setup, Tapir then is kind of limited in, in its um, applicability to large data sets. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, nice to point this out because it's a good benchmark and I also included the link to their GitHub repo here because they shared the benchmark results and the benchmark kind of um, Python bindings to, to use it for your own models. I'm already kind of running <laughs> out of time, but two quick uh, highlights from the table representation learning workshop. Of course, here the topic was table representation learning, but actually there was very little representation learning uh, going on in that workshop. Um, but this uh, paper caught some attention also previously uh, before the uh, workshop actually. Hyperfast, it's kind of a meta learning approach of having a neural network predict the weights of your actual network that then does a classification and kind of a zero or few shot um, scenario. It's a really um, well received paper and I can also encourage you to look at it more closely. The basic idea is also conceptually simple. You have this kind of meta learning approach, what I just said. The implementation details and the actual architecture are a bit more elaborate. I guess there's a lot of design choices to be made. It's not so super important. Um, check it out. It's really quite interesting. What they do is they solve the problem. I think that's worth noticing. Um, when you generalize across tables in tabular data, you often have the problem of you have to generalize from tables of different widths and column names and stuff like that. So what they do, they do a random projection to some high dimensional latent space, which uh, then they reduce to a fixed length dimension by using kind of a PCA reduction. So that's kind of their trick to, to go around the problem of having different, uh, differently sized tables. Um, and lastly, I think that was actually going in fully uh, aligned with also what we're looking at and representation learning for tabulars, for tabular data on specifically heterogeneous tabular data. So the knowledge graph paper in the front in the, or in the, the beginning of the talk kind of used separate domain knowledge by using this pre-trained knowledge graph. Another question or approach would be to, to learn one single model across a whole diversity, a whole benchmark or a whole collection of data sets. But for example, because uh, you don't really know how to generalize across tables because of the different widths, um, you're a bit um, yeah, technically challenged to do so. What uh, these people do, so uh, Yak and others from Google actually, they build a framework for something they call the tabular foundation model to leverage actually training from heterogeneous tabular data sets. Um, the, the approach is very sim simple actually, and it's not, if you're familiar with kind of transformer approaches for tabular data, not super surprising. They basically interpret a row as a key value sequence of tokens, pass it through a transformer and do their prediction. May it be classification or regression. They introduce some novel things that, which they call the map transformer, which kind of has a different attention mechanism when dealing with key tokens and value tokens. So if you have a feature that has a feature name, you, that's a key, you might not want to um, impute that, uh, but you want to impute the value, for example. So there are some technical details to this, but which are not super important, um, but it's actually um, quite interesting. So this is kind of the overview of the architecture. What they do is they use the contextual knowledge um, or the semantic knowledge from the metadata they have for each table by passing it through an LLM and using kind of the representation that come out of those to concatenate with uh, the value embeddings basically which they get from their regular encoders and embedders. So it's conceptually a nice idea. On the evaluation side, it's a bit, um, it's a bit small. They own, I mean, they talk about foundation models, but they evaluate on three data sets and they don't really do any cross table representation learning. Um, but it's conceptually quite nice, so check it out. And uh, I'll conclude with some um, self-advertising because we also had a presentation at the same workshop investigating something very similar, so learning for uh, tabular representations across tables. So if you're interested in that, check that out as well. And with that, if you have some questions, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give some more technical <laughs> details because I've read all the papers, um, but for time's sakes, I didn't uh, include all of it. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Any questions from the online crowd? No, we just have people complaining about the sound. Um, okay, but maybe we need some more time to ingest this material and we'll come back with our questions some other time. Yeah, happy to talk about it after also. Great.
thank you very much. So next up is Martin. Uh, Martin is also a machine learning research team lead with us. Um, you have a new interest, I know, which is sequential data. And I think that's also going to be your presentation today. Yes, that's true. Great. So, thanks so much. Let's yeah, we'll going. close this round. So we learned something about um, tabular data. So I will now speak about like, um, well, something related, which is time series data. So it's also structured data. Um, I also noticed that we didn't speak about large language models so far here. Um, and of course, this was also a huge topic at Europe's. Um, so I will somehow try to connect these two things and um, well discuss how we could get to foundational or more foundational like models for time series data and how we could make use of generative AI for this. All right, so um, I guess you all know what a time series is and maybe you've also seen machine learning algorithms before for time series, but uh, to be on the same page, um, let me give you a bit of background here. So there's several tasks that are of interest here. Classical one is classification where the input is a time series or a shorter time frame of a time series and you're interested in uh, a labeling, right? So you would like to do a classification and labels are required, of course. Related or some related is anomaly detection where you're actually interested in abnormal behavior, some extreme values in your time series. Um, outliers. So here also you need some kind of labels or at least a rule how to specify what it actually an outlier is. And finally, and maybe most popular is forecasting, right? So here you simply think of predicting the future from the past. And you can also think of this as a point forecasting problem, but what is I think more popular is really to think of this as a probabilistic task. So you really want to predict um, like a whole distribution of the future, right? So what is likely, and you would also like to do some kind of uncertainty modification. And this is what I will mostly focus on, focus on here in this presentation. Um, well, I mean, time series and this is a like decades old topic, right? So there are many classical algorithms, statistical algorithms, similar to tabular data. Of course, also machine learning has entered the field. And I think quite remarkable, remarkable fact, also very similar to tabular data is that I think it's fair to say that deep learning methods and neural networks are by many people not considered as the gold standard, right? So still gradient booster trees and related algorithms are the way to go in many problems. And I think there are many reasons for this. Um, one, for instance, is like, does not always apply, but in many cases you have very little high quality data, maybe only a very few labels. So you cannot really satisfy the assumptions that you typically need for deep learning algorithms. And also one thing which I think is quite interesting is the role of context, right? So think of time series for finance data. Also, you can think of time series data for healthcare data, right? So they might look very similar from their seasonality, their trends, but contextually they are quite different and you need to somehow incorporate this textual knowledge. So typically this is done by feature engineering, right? And so it's not so clear how you would do this with simple like deep learning algorithms, which come with the promise to really avoid this kind of feature engineering. Right, so one way or one potential game changer in the field could be representation learning, in particular self-supervised learning. So I guess you've all heard of um, the big success of um, autoregressive models and transformers. And also like this um, really caught interest in the field. And um, one notable contribution is the time GPT paper. As the name says, it's a foundational model or authors claim it's really like a foundational model for time series. It really works in an autoregressive fashion like the decoder only models, uh, GPT like models. Um, so there's some more, there are more and more works in this direction. Also a bit, bit of shameless self-advertisement. We also presented a, a paper in this direction, not about foundation models, but about representation learning at Europe's in a um, workshop on self-supervised learning. Okay, so far so good. Um, so now I come really like to the, the actual part of this presentation, which um, is a paper that I found quite interesting. Um, as I said, uh, announced, it it's somehow tries to connect large language models with time series forecasting. And <laughs> yeah, basically the title says it all. Really, it's, it's about using off-the-shelf large language models, pre-trained large language models to do 
forecasting. And the idea is really, really, really simple. So basically, if you look at the picture, I think everything is clear. So, <laughs> so what large language models, like autoregressive large language models are made for is to predict the next word, right? So they give us some like distribution to, to predict the next, the, the most likely word. Well, what you could do if you have your time series, you could view this as, as numbers, of course, right? These are numbers and you could view the numbers as words, right? So basically you can encode them as tokens. So I can now pass them through an LLM and get a prediction for the next token. Hopefully that's a number, which I can again interpret as, as a um, floating point number and I can use this as my prediction. That's basically the whole story of the paper, right? So it's somehow appears very natural, right? So, I mean, you could do this, the idea is super simple, but somehow it's also a bit crazy because, well, all this LM stuff is really about qualitative results, right? So we are really interested in generating good text, but forecasting is really something quantitative, right? So conceptually it makes sense. It's, it's an autoregressive procedure, but at least from, from like the, like, well, the task that you wish to solve is quite different. So what the authors argue, um, I, I think you can see the quote here, yeah. Um, so basically they argue, well, maybe the reason why this actually works is that large language models have learned the huge cohorts of data, um, many different types of multimodal distributions, and they also have a certain bias for simplicity, periodicity, and repetitions. So these are features that definitely also play an important role in time series, like seasonality and also trends. So at least this gives some intuition why this could actually make sense. Um, I don't want to go to, into too many details here, and um, but one thing that I wanted to mention, which is, I think quite interesting, is the aspect of tokenization. As you know, this is a super important thing in large language models often underestimated, so the role of tokenization. And it's also quite well known that typically numbers are quite problematic. Okay, so I mean, already teetering, so they consider GPT-like models and Llama-like models. Um, so for instance, it turns out for GPT-like models, they did a little trick. They just entered, added some, some extra spaces so that somehow the digits were tokenized individually. So that really led to much better outcomes and that um, compared to just like the raw input. On the other hand for Llama, which uses a different tokenizer, um, which actually really tokenizes every digit individually, quite the opposite is true. So then adding additional blanks was, um, was quite harmful there. So you really have to be careful. And also you have to think of like things like decimal um, points and, and floating point precision. So basically here it was just picks and in that sense, if the number of, of um, digits after, after the decimal point separator is fixed, you can just leave it out. So that's, that's the main idea here. Okay, so that was one aspect I wanted to mention. Of course, also few results. Um, so they really considered very popular models, GPT-3, Llama 270B, and also GPT-4. Fun fact, GPT-4 actually was performing worse. And the reason for this is that the publicly available version is a, an instruction tuned model, which is not so well suited for things like, it should, for instance, not repeat content, right? Which other models tend to. And so um, they found out actually, this is maybe not the, the best idea to do some instruction tuning before. So the really like the, the raw models perform better in the end. Okay. And they also um, yeah, uh, evaluated several uh, popular benchmark darts, Unash uh, and uh, Informer. And essentially what they found is that actually, although this is, as I said, somewhat crazy, um, the performance was quite decent, right? So they, on the one hand, really did some sampling, which you can do with large language models. You can do probabilistic forecasts. So it was quite competitive with standard algorithms, um, which you can use for machine learning. And as I said, there's no fine tuning or such thing involved. It's just zero shot, right? So there's no tuning at all, right? No training, which is quite remarkable. And um, also for point forecasting, measuring and mean absolute error, also perform quite well. So um, yeah, so I mean, of course these are like standard benchmarks and this is maybe not what people would look at like in real world scenarios where things are a bit more messy and, and complicated, where there's more noise and data, 
where the situation is not so clear, but at least I think it's it's a very nice proof of concept that this yeah, somewhat um, surprisingly simple idea actually works quite well. Okay, so I wanted to mention a few other highlights that are related. So I mentioned generative AI in the beginning, so there were more, more works about this. So one paper um, basically did the same, but not with language, but with images. So in principle, you can also view a time series as an image, like you see in the picture, and well, you can just pass through a vision transformer, pre-trained vision transformer. And they found that it's quite helpful for irregularly sample time series, which are a bit tricky to handle with classical algorithms. Right, so very similar idea, but different modality. And also diffusion models were already discussed. This also um, popped up in time series, especially for generating synthetic data, but you could also in principle use them for inference. So yeah, generative AI is all over the place, also for structured data. <laughs> So in the end, let me also do a bit of like, discuss the broader context, also some limitations, um, also coming back to this original quest for foundation models. So I think all these works make hope that there will be future breakthroughs in the field, especially when it comes to pre-trained models. So hopefully there will be progress in the next years. Um, this work I think is a nice proof of concept. So it shows this idea actually works, but I think probably practitioners would not use this off the shelf. So there are some limitations, for instance, the tokenization, um, which can be quite unstable. Um, also context size plays a role. So we're using transformers model, uh, transformer models, which have this quadratic scaling. So there might be better models for long-term forecasting. Also the evaluation is, I would say, quite limited, so these are just standard benchmarks, so it would be interesting to see how this performs on more complicated real-world setups. And also, like, the main question is, did they really tune all the baselines um, well enough, like, to really see if, if, the, if the language models outperform from these baselines? And another thing which I find is quite important here, um, so zero shot is fine, so no training wolf, but as you know, like, hosting a Llama 2 model is quite expensive, even the inference. So it might be faster to just train an XG boost model. Um, so I think it's a fair question to ask here and to do these, to think of these trade-offs. Yeah, and um, when, it really, when it really comes to foundation models, I think there are a few like open chains, maybe, maybe there are more. Um, well, some things that come to my mind are the following. So one important thing, of course, is data, right? So of course, there's huge amounts of, of time series and also tabular data in industry, but typically it's not public. Right, so we need somehow, there is no thing like a time series internet. So I think this is a really important prerequisite to, to make progress in this direction. And also this thing with context is quite important, right? So I think context is quite different here compared to images and text. So, so far what we do is we add some domain knowledge, we do some feature engineering. And the main question is, can we circumvent this in some way? Really use an off-the-shelf algorithm that performs decently, also on real-world data. So that's the ultimate goal. And also things um, like fine-tuning in context learning, like also with TAPFN could be quite interesting. So when I um, went to the post, I asked the, uh, one of the, the authors, well, in principle, what you could do is you could also fine-tune your large language model to perform much better on time series, right? So, I mean, that's perfectly fine. You could try this and I guess somebody will do this or maybe they already did. So um, that is quite interesting, I think. All right, so I think that's all I wanted to say. Thanks so much. Thank you, Martin. Any questions from the audience? Thanks a lot. Um, I find it's quite remarkable that uh, there is some kind of universal, seems to be some kind of universal, uh, I don't know, principles that underlie all kind of serious data, be it text or uh, yeah, this numbers or from, from. So what, so you already speculated a little bit in your talk, so, but I'm still wondering like what is that makes those language models perform well also on a, on a, on a, on just like a series of numbers what do you think what are those those uh, yeah general principles that allows to do that yeah so i think like 
it's really an open question, I would say. So like, basically, I um, essentially would repeat um, like this, what, what you also said, right? So I think large language models have a tendency to repeat themselves, right? If you don't fine tune them, like instruction fine tune them. So that essentially corresponds to some kind of seasonality, right? So also bias towards simplicity is quite important here. So they have more experiments in the paper where they um, actually analyze some analytic sequences, not like real world data. And they might some interesting findings there as well. Maybe another reason might be, it's not so clear. Maybe the large language model has seen some kind of time series data during training with all the text data in the internet. Very unlikely that it is in the form that they considered, but I don't know, maybe there is a connection. Actually, I also did some experiment um, to um, exclude the, the option of leakage, right? So it might be that the new, like Llama 2 has seen all the time series data sets before in some one or the other form, but they also tested with some data set that was definitely um, released after one of the one of the models was was trained. So it still worked. Um, yeah, but but a good answer. It, it's like somehow like a miracle, right? So it's like it's crazy. Like I mean, the idea is super simple, but it's it's not so clear why it, why it works so well. Thank you. Generative AI is magic. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, did they do any tests on manipulating the data, like? Can you say get a time series, even if it's just a sine wave, and then resample to monthly data, and then it will do it? Or can you say get an FFT of the data and then give me the FFT values? Because if it can do this, then I would say there's some magic going on, but otherwise I think it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think they don't do such experiments. As I said, they have some like synthetic data, um, but would be interesting to explore. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, yeah. Um, did they, in the evaluation, did they um, restrict the language models in some way? So, like, did they use some grammatics that was allowed to use? So, like, if the language model pulled out uh, some weird words that wasn't time series, did they then count this as a failure or did they just restrict the language model to not put that out? Yeah, good question. So I would have to go back to the paper. Um, I think they mentioned some details in, in the appendix. So in principle, what you could do is, I mean, what you get is like a, like a ranking, right, of the next like most likely words. So you could just simply go forward to the first digit and use this one if is, this is not the most likely thing anyways. So that might be a simple strategy, but I don't remember what they did exactly. Um, yeah. And yeah, my question was actually about very much the same because they predict over the the dictionary size, right? Which is like a hundred thousand uh, dimensions, I think, for like GPT three or something like that. And if you only allow for this fixed point quantization, you basically predict out of ten tokens. So if you masked out everything, but the ten tokens, your probabilities are probably extremely noisy. Um, so I was wondering if they said something about but i that. think like the input you know like the input is quite reg regular right so i mean you 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 give it like a long long sequence of numbers as input so i think like it won't be that noisy in the end you just just don't pass any text before right so um yeah but but would be interesting to see so i haven't checked out their code um yeah Yeah, so there's one question from the chat from Jose who asked, so you upload time series data to an LLM, ask it to make predictions, and it does state-of-the-art results without any parameter search, question mark. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was a quick one. Do we have a, <laughs> any last question or... <laughs> All right, I think um, we're gonna wrap it up. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Also thanks everyone online. 
Um, sorry that the audio was going in and out a little bit. We will try to debug it for next time. Um, and everyone who's around here, feel free to hang around for a bit, um, mingle with the speakers or each other um, or both. And we will see you in a month, um, first week of March. Thanks.